Ladies and gents, boys and girls, hello and a very warm welcome to the Biro Workshop. This is a video about one of the best single scholars I've ever seen. It's a low steady state practice with a bit of higher stroke rate stuff in, in there. Uh, this guy is a Dutch rower and if you know anything about um, country specific rowing styles, um, the Dutch rowing is usually not famous for lots of upper body swing. But look at this guy. Look at him row. This is, <laughs> there's so much to learn from it. Well, there are certain things when I look at them, um, my heart just starts to sing. I'm a passionate rower. Passion is such a cheesy word to be used, but um, rowing has shaped my life since I was 10 years old. And if I see something like this, it makes my heart sing. This is joy. For every rowing coach, for every rower, watching this is joy. Now, what is it that brings joy and what is it that makes this rowing so, so special? And it definitely is very special. Let's go through the details. So let's look at the, the flow of the motion. Please monitor the bow, what the bow does. The bow is consistently in motion. So that's one of the things that I always watch for is, is are you able to have an almost uninterrupted boat flow? There are tricks how to achieve this and he certainly has got it figured out. The second thing is that you may notice that his upper back is pretty bent and round. Okay, that's probably exaggerated. It might not be super healthy. I think he's a very tall guy. Energy goes through the armpit down here. So if we just follow that line, his bend is pretty much where, where the energy comes through. It is not below that point. So a lot of people have a very bent low back right here, but he doesn't have that. It's right there. It's just below. It's not healthy, but it's also not detrimentally bad. Will he have or might he have um, issues with the muscles around that part uh, in the future? Very well likely. I do believe he should be a bit more up, uh, upright and have this bend a bit farther up. But that's what it is right now. So he's not perfect. And it's very difficult to find somebody who's perfect. First of all, look at the blades. How deep do they enter? Well, there are no Randall voice attached, so they enter too deep. That is a fact, but they don't enter as deep as you see with many other single scholars who simply bury the blade so deep just, just so that they can feel some kind of resistance. Now, a lot of athletes catch too deep with the blades and they confuse a deep catch with an effective catch. A deep catch will give you kind of resistance, but it's not the kind of resistance you're looking for to propel the boat. Because either you're going down with a blade or you're connecting horizontally. You've got one of the two options. If you do a mix of that, there's a trade-off in both directions. So it's a loss either way. What we want is to put the blades into the water just where they would naturally float. So there's an exercise that I use with my athletes as we go to the finish position that's also how you set up um, the orlock height, the proper orlock height. And then we square the blades and let them flow in the water where it would naturally float. No vertical interference. The moment you start to pull, the, the, the top edge of the blade usually submerges just, just below the water surface. That's precisely where the rainbow foil will hold you. That's how deep you want to go with the blade at the catch. The catch, that's what most people confuse as well, is not bringing the blades into the water. No, the catch is the connection phase between your blade and the wa water, not vertically, but horizontally. So we are looking for the connection phase here. Water, water, if that makes sense. We're looking for this here. That's the catch. You have to make a very simple decision. I always say kill fish at the catch. You want to go fishing or you want to row. If you want to kill fish, go as deep as you can, but it's not going to make the boat faster. If you want to catch and row quickly, you have to make sure you, you stabilize the blade vertically as, as quickly as possible. That's exactly why Ian Randall came up with the Randall foil. Ian is a genius, I think. Um, he just came up, he wrote an article on Junior Rowing News, and I'm going to quote it in one of the next videos. I'm going to talk about this, where he came, where, where he, um, picked up idea, an idea that, that actually uh, was used in cycling where you use little uh, 
you know, damper stickers uh, so that you avoid scratching the floor. They put them on, I think, on, on the cyclist's arms and he tried this on, the, on his oars to, <laughs> to <laughs> introduce less wind resistance. That's, that's so genius and it's not illegal. You can actually use it. But I will talk about this in a different video. Subscribe if you want to be the first one to know about this. And you have to hit that notification bell as well. So what Goose Molly is doing extremely well is he's really trying to focus on the horizontal connection, not on the vertical placement. So he knows that the catch is horizontal, not vertical. And that's for you beginner rowers out there so essential. I know that it's, it's being taught quite often just for lack of time um, that you have to catch deep and hard so that you feel something. But if you catch deep and hard, you, you waste so much time and the body is set up the wrong way. This is the most ineffective way to start a, a drive in my humble opinion. So the next good thing is if you monitor his shoulders closely, first of all, his shoulders are in that what I call forward and down position. And that's what I've been teaching the last couple of sessions in these Saturday Life sessions, where we try, we do a lot of drills, but we try to bring the, the upper arm forward and low. So what this looks like from the side is that you wanna you want to bring the upper arm, not the hands, not the elbows, the upper arm forward and low. And this will give you a bit of a stretch around the shoulder blades. At the same time, it will tuck the shoulder right into the trunk. The shoulder is a fragile part of the body and it's too fragile to cope with all the energy that your legs can produce. So you have to find a way how to tuck the shoulder right into the trunk without injuring it. Yet at the same time, it shouldn't be a weak part of this entire chain of energy. The chain of energy, and I've referred to this many, many times, uh, goes in such a way. First of all, from ankles to knees, that's a di direct line of energy. From knees to hip joint, that's a direct line of energy. Here come all the weak spots. So in Goose's case, it's all the way up to his first bend, then the second bend. Hey, but at least the bend is far up. I mean, this is really good. And then the question is, if you, if you have high shoulders, you will um, trigger mostly the traps and the erectors and you will not go through the latissimus dorsi. And the goal is to go through the lats as much as you can because they're much bigger and they stretch all the way down into the back. If you look at the muscle, I mean, this is like made for rowing, but the weak point still remains to be the shoulders and the shoulders need to be tucked into the trunk as much as possible. And that is precisely what we did um, in, in, in the last couple of Saturdays. If you want to join, it's a couple bucks a month. Anyway, all the info on rmtraining.com. So Goose is set up extremely well. His, his shoulders are tucked into the trunk. And watch what happens now. This is spectacular. Uh, in, in the edit, I will try to zoom in. I, it will be a bit grainy. Nevertheless, I hope you can see this. There's a slight bit of stretch happening the moment the leg drive starts, which is now. You see this? And it's not just the stretch. It's also the idea to bring the hands together. I'm not sure if he's doing that on purpose, but what I perceive to see is that he's trying to use his pectoralis minor, so the outside of the chest muscle, to bring the straight arms together, a bit like a crab. What this does is it transfers force right around the pins. This is something you lose in a linear erg, but in the boat, you have to relearn it, or you practice on a true, in a true rowing environment all winter. This idea of closing your arms is essential because it triggers your shoulders in a much different way than any linear erg does. You need your lats and you need the chest. And the chest is a big factor in that because if you're able to transfer force around the pins, you're transferring force precisely where it needs to be transferred. It's not like a linear pull and your hands kind of have to handle whatever force you throw at them. No, you're really going with a lot of feeling around the pins and you don't bend your arms to make this happen, which is the classic mistake when you go from the linear arc to the boat. No, he's able to keep his arms long and go around and close that here. And that is, that is um, a rare thing to see. It is a rare thing to see. And I think this guy's got a tremendous feeling for the motion and how to apply force. See, he's lengthening out his shoulders, but he's keeping the shoulders low. You see a lot of people lengthening out the shoulders, but not many people have them low. Um, I just looked at the, at the Henley Cordoba Skulls 2022, Australia versus China. And in my humble opinion, especially the Australian ladies, um, have their shoulders way too high. If you're interested in me doing a video analysis um, about this quad, about this quad race, just let me know, drop it in the comments, please. 
Now, he's able to, to get this stretch. The question is, how does this stretch happen? Well, that's also something we practice in these Saturday sessions. It's something you usually don't learn. The moment at the catch, when you start the leg drive, initially, when you start to push with your legs, let me draw this, this is, this is vital to understand. So, when you start to push with your legs, the energy goes from your feet into the hip, into the back, in his case a bit around, into your arms, all the way onto your blades. Hopefully your blades are vertically stabilized and then you can hold on to the water. Imagine that the blades are vertically stabilized, which is not the case in 99% of all cases. Imagine this were the case. Then, if you had the perfect force transfer, there is not a good ratio of force input from your legs through the body. Imagine you could hold it and everybody would be as perfectly positioned as Goose Molly is. The, the ratio between force input and speed output of your boat is not good at the catch. It's not a good speed ratio. Same on the by rower, same in the erg, same in every environment that you start to re-accelerate. So initially a good deal of that force will, because water has infinite inertia, go back into your hands, into your shoulders. And somewhere here your legs will probably not give in because they're super strong. So it will hit the weakest link. And one of the, <laughs> some of the weak links definitely are the shoulders. Any kind of bend you have and usually the pelvic position. This is where the energies meet again. Now there are two ways to cope with this. 99% of all athletes either use the upper body early, which is too early at that stage, or um, bend their arms because if you add a weak link you have to reduce force from your legs. There's nothing you can do about this. It, it, it's, an autom it's an automated self-protection mechanism. And if, if, you're, if you're telling your athletes, well just get harder with the legs, hey, they will bend their arms more and eventually some, something in their bodies will give in. That's not healthy. Um, and having a hard and deep catch just makes it worse because you connect slower and eventually the entire force hits you and you've just wasted the entire potential at the catch. So how do you deal with this? Well, you try to be as, that's what we did in the Saturday sessions, you try to be as well braced as you possibly can. So one of the bracing points is with the hands away, you want to push forward with the low back and pull the ventral chain up as long as you can, okay? That's on a recovery when you go forward. Then you do this thing with um, your upper arm pulls your shoulders down and forward, so they are compact in the trunk. Yet, a bit of energy will come back. And the trick is to use a bit of that energy to pull your shoulders long. So you achieve the final perfect posture and positioning with that bit of energy that returns into your body at the catch. So you're careful with your legs, you don't go hard, but also you can't be slow. You have to be quick with the legs, but soft and sensible. You have to sensitive. It's completely reversed in German. You have to be sensitive, you have to feel what's going on. So you have to feel with your legs how much can my shoulders handle and how much not. And then you just give enough with your legs so that you can actually connect the water with the blades and at the same time you feel, ah, the shoulders I wanted them to give a bit. And that give of the shoulders is a bit of this. But if your shoulders are high up, well, you just stretch the erectors and the upper body will go up because these are too small of a muscle. You have to have low shoulders and then you can use the lat. The thing is, every muscle that is under tension and under stretch will be the one that transfers. You, yeah, you want that one to transfer. So at the catch, when you do that, and at the same time you do that stretch forward and close, that is precisely how you generate picture-perfect force curve on a bar rower, an immediate force pickup. And a lot of people think, ah, it just needs quicker leg drive. No, it needs the preparation of the entire body. All right, so what I'm referring to is the classic thing that many people do when they hop from the linear erg into the boat, they will do this. And the reason is that on the linear erg you're used to pull straight. Well, this doesn't trigger your shoulders precisely the way they should be triggered. So what we need is the ability to go in, to go together, to close the, to close the hands. 
and a lot of people think, you look at the force curves. So red for right, green for left, just like in the boat. And what, what we want, or what I want as a coach, is a curve that looks a bit like this, a plateau with a bit of a peak at the ending in low steady state. So in, in race pace, none of that is gonna be left. It's gonna be a plateau at best. So how do you achieve this? And it doesn't require much force, but it requires to, di to direct energy in a 90 degree angle to the ore handle. So you don't wanna pull like that because this is gonna bring a lot of wastes. But this is what you used to when we erg because your shoulders have lost a, their mobility and their mobility and strength to move around. So what we need to teach them again is how do you pull in, 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 short, short piece straight out again because this is what the rowing stroke actually looks like. So like that. And if you're not used to go in, of course, you cannot just force it to go straight. The, the, the boat doesn't ask you, hey, would you like to go straight today? It, it's going the way it's going. So what we, end, what, what we then end up doing, in a negative example now, we have to create some kind of, uh, we have to get out of the way. So either we do this, because this is gonna bring the hands together, or we're gonna do that, that's gonna bring the hands together as well. So very often, it's not even the case that people don't wanna bend their arms or don't wanna bring the upper body up too early. They just have lost the capability or the idea or the muscle memory, which is probably true in 99% of all cases, of how to transfer force from the legs so that I can use my extended arms to go around the pins. That, ladies and gentlemen, I think is the main problem. So my athletes, remember what we did on Saturdays. This is precisely what we've been practicing for. And Guz Molle, <laughs> he can do it. He, he can do it. It's, just, it's not perfect, but it's very, very well executed. Okay. So he's closing his arms. He uses a bit of the energy that goes back into the body for the drive. Now he's able to start the leg drive. Now the ratio is very good. Now he's opening the upper body. In my humble opinion, it's a bit early, but I also wouldn't prefer to have it much later because if you open your upper body too late, the angle becomes ah, disadvantageous. So that leg drive to upper body motion is ideal. Now, one very decisive thing is happening. He's opening the upper body with his legs. He's not doing the classic mistake a lot of people are making. They're trying to it's coach said legs and then upper body and then arms. No, this is not how it works. I, I'm thinking of doing a basic learn to row video because there are so many wrong concepts, in my humble opinion, that if, if, we, if we taught rowing the other way around, I think it would just so, be so much easier. Let me please know if you want a video like that. I'm, I don't want to throw a beginner's video at you, but if you're interested, please let me know. So. What he's doing extremely well is that he's doing the upper body swing from the mid of his body. If you've ever watched a golf swing, they come from the hip. So the upper body swing comes from the hip as well. It doesn't come from the upper part where you rip up. No, you want to stay as low and compact as you can and move from the low part of the trunk. Why? Well, the trunk itself is designed, if you look at the muscles, to avoid rotation. That's pretty much the main capacity of the muscles that we've got in our trunk. So we don't have the capacity to generate much of emotion. The question is, how do we do this upper body swing then? Well, this is how we do it. We use the hamstrings, we use the glutes, we use the low back, and this one is a lever, and we try to pull the ventral chain as long as we can. Why? Well, if you pull the ventral chain long, it's interconnected with the pelvis, and then you can use the entire trunk as a lever. If we didn't have our trunk under control, and Goose Molly certainly does have his trunk under control, well, then we couldn't do an upper body swing with a long lever, but with a short lever around the, the hip joint, which is what most rowers have, which is why they miss out on, the, on, on their body weight potential. Um, I've recently done a video on that Henley double... <sighs> Mondelli Rambaldi versus Oppo and Ruta, the Italian heavyweight 
uh, versus the Italian lightweight double, was it 2017, I think. Uh, both in the medals at the Worlds a couple of weeks later, yet the heavies were not using upper body weight completely. And th that is not just a thing of, of that Italian boat. Many athletes are doing this because it's scary. You can make a lot of mistakes, but it's much better to make a lot of mistakes and be faster and then learn how to use the upper body properly. If you know how to do this, you will be significantly faster. That's precisely what I'm trying to teach in these Saturday classes. It's, it's, it's not rocket science, but you, your muscles have to become accustomed to being triggered in a different way. And Goose Molle is using his low trunk to generate to well to hold to have stability he's using his legs muscles so the final part are the quads the quads the front of your legs of your upper legs will trigger attention of the antagonist the antagonist are the hamstrings and glutes so the quads kick hard with the upper body swing it's not like the legs are done and no they're going full send this is where your legs are the strongest so if you could normally do i don't know uh 100 kilo squat with your legs almost extended you probably could do 150 to 200 kilo squat if your back can hold it or a leg press i don't know if you can normally do uh, 300 kilos you might be able to do 400 kilos just that bit of extension um, you can change the, the angle is a very good one so at that stage your legs don't have to be careful anymore at that stage <laughs> sorry sorry about the drawing explosion at that stage your legs can go full send and swing your upper body open. All your trunk has to do, quote unquote, is stay upright and interconnected with the pelvis. And then your quads trigger the antagonist, which is hamstrings and glutes, which then in turn open the hip angle and the upper body swing happens. Sounds easy? It is. At least I do think it is. So, and the good thing is that you can see Goose Molly still has his tension here. Ah, in the ventral chain, the front. This is where it happens. It doesn't happen here somewhere. That's like, hey, you're a rower, you have big arms. No, you've never seen a rower. <laughs> we rowers don't have big arms. Uh, we rowers have massive wide trunks and big legs. And not necessarily the lower part closer down to close to our knees. Where we are big is everything above the kneecap up to just below the chest. This is where we are big big this is where we move everything so let's let's follow this once more massive low trunk control yes he yeah, yes he's got a washout i think that's the early upper body motion and he's also quite lazy at the finish but that's a dutch rowing style typically speaking many dutch rowers don't use a lot of upper body swing so seeing this kind of technique from one of the top dutch rowers is rare and exceptionally good. I remember I did a video analysis on the men's court double skull at the World Championships 2017. That was before World Rowing um, asked me to take down all the videos that I did with footage of their platform. And I wasn't able to find an agreement with them I say, look, I pay for 30 seconds of the footage. They refuse it. It's never going to happen. I think now to have a new director um, that is, you know, director for, I don't know what this is, marketing. I'm not quite sure. Um, but until one and a half years ago, I could, I just could not find an agreement with them. Um, super nice, but super reserved as well when it comes to that. No, you can't have even 30 seconds. When I did this analysis, I still have it, but I will not send it to anybody and not publish it because I keep my word to World Rowing. Um, you could see that this was the year the Dutch had their super upright finish and they were in the lead at the 1500 open weight men's quad. And then they were overtaken by the Baltic states. I think it was Estonia and Lithuania that overtook them. And there was no, and even the British. And there was nothing the Dutch could do because they were missing out on that upper body motion. And the year later, they had it. The year later, they did that. And this was the year when the Dutch quad became unbeatable. And I think Goose Molle rose precisely that style. Let's look at him rowing once a, a bit more. 
there's there's a lot to be said but just that feeling at the catch that slowliness of getting the blades into the water not punching deep but trying to sense although the stroke is going up and yes there is no Randall foil attached but that ability to close the arms to go around the pins so this is something you usually lose on a linear erg and this is what people keep on a buyer rower that he's got it all he's got it all and there's a now you can see he's a bit of ducking at the catch and his blades are going up and he's not perfect but there are many many good things we can learn from that especially how to use the trunk and somebody suggested just a few minutes ago on youtube um say could i have a look at the danish lightweight men's four of the 2008 olympic games beijing yes yes their backs were even rounder than that and they were so fast so if you're interested in myself doing that video analysis of the danish lightweight men's four of the beijing olympics 2008 hey just drop me a comment let me know and subscribe and hit the notification bell so next time you're notified right when a video comes out all right with this being said if you want to work with me for example join the saturday life classes or get a proper training plan uh, or both or do one-on-one -on -one sessions with me that's what I do besides the Biro project. So this is where you, you would find most of the progress. Um, go to rmtraining.com, fill out the program and the questionnaire. The link for that is in the description below. You don't have to get started right now, or if you can, do it right now, because every week we have is important for your peak of season. The way it usually works is that um, I will ask you, what is the most important race of your season? And then we think back, how many weeks have we got? What are your weaknesses? What are your strengths? Where are you right now? What do we need to compensate for? Are you explosive? Are you endurance? Um, and then we slowly get going and make sure you have a solid base and a very high output for your main peak of season. All right. And if you're interested in the buyer rower, <laughs> that's, I should do a video on the buyer rower myself, how this all started. If you're interested, please let me know in the comments. Essentially, I started, um, 20 years ago, no, 22 years ago, 23 years ago. No money, no experience, nothing. <laughs> I was naive to start this thing. Um, a good friend of mine and I had played around with this rowing machine-like thing, a rowing boat-like thing on dry land that would not hurt my back. Um, I was part of the under 23 national team then, and I was so frustrated with the entire experience of having given everything and then being in a system that wasn't very professional. The first thing I decided to do was to build a rowing machine that would not destroy my back, unless the, un, unlike these linear ergs that I had to use every day for a couple of hours. That was the first thing. The second thing was that I wanted to be the coach that I would have needed. I had um, good coaches for a good deal of the time, but I felt like when it came to peak, um, the system wasn't very professional at all. I felt that I would have needed somebody who would take my hand as a partner and say, look, we're in this together and let's build this from scratch and see how far we can bring you. And not just to, to the national team and just leave you with the national team because that doesn't work. Uh, this is why I became a coach. All right, that's a different topic. Thank you for sticking around so long. I try to bring out relevant videos. And if you're interested in anything specific, hey, just drop me a comment or contact me on rowing.zone. That's the rowing enthusiast platform for free, made for everybody who likes rowing. Uh, there's a free classified ads page. And I just try to connect everybody who likes rowing, CrossFit, beginners, indoor rowers, um, a woman with 300 pounds trying to lose half of her body weight. Everybody who likes rowing should be able to connect there. It's small and it's slowly growing and I appreciate everybody who contributes. Now with this being said, that's it for today. Thank you for watching the entire video and I wish you all the best and I see you in the next video and you'll learn about it if you hit the notification bell. See you then, bye-bye.